Ender Lilies is the last game I was expecting to fall in love with this year. I bought it on Early Access a few months ago, not really sure what to expect from the game outside of general Metroidvania experience, movement abilities, backtracking, go here to go there to do this thing, break the door down and complete the true ending of whatever. The Early Access build ended coincidentally behind this gate where I just saw this thing pulsating on the other side. And obviously, I had some questions. Is it an enemy? Do I get to fight it? Is it someone's house, perhaps? Or just an NPC with an incredibly sad backstory? I was eager to revisit this exact room once the full game released, and it turns out it was an enemy. And I got my ass kicked as soon as the gate lowered, so that was pretty cool. Long ago, in the distant reaches of Land's End, the unforeseen descent of the rain transformed all living things into frenzied undead monstrosities known as the Blighted. The Blight took hold of the kingdom, the rot spreading throughout the mines, bodies, and souls of everyone living there. The rot is capable of regenerating flesh, turning its host undead, and the link of mind and body is separated very soon after the Blight takes hold of them. There were a small number of those afflicted who wouldn't lose their mind completely, and they would be able to retain only a bit of who they were, but who's to say is really the more desirable option. The one thing worse than being undead is being aware of it. There was one young woman in the kingdom, the White Priestess, who showed a powerful resistance to the curse and was capable of performing miracles and cleansing the afflicted. Word of her miracles spread rapidly across the kingdom and people began considering this priestess a savior of sorts, following her guidance and even forming a congregation known as the White Parish. They didn't worship any god, but instead they followed and studied the blessings of the White Priestess. White priestesses have the ability to purify the blight and cleanse the souls of those afflicted. A white priestess is born with a natural resistance to the affliction, leaving her soul completely untarnished while still being able to draw the blight out from others who suffer from it. Now, the trade-off for this immunity is far from insignificant. Despite her soul remaining untarnished, the lingering blight can still be seen in how it affects her physical appearance, causing the priestess an agonizing and horrendous pain. A priestess will eventually show signs of physical degradation and rot spreading through her body as she continues to purify the blighted. But I think that's where my lore talk should end, because I don't feel like I can dive much further into the story without risking spoilers. Ender Lilies puts you at the door of Land's End, a kingdom curse-rotted and worn down by a cataclysmic event known as the Reign of Death. The game houses eight areas in total with a very interesting level design that brings each area to life, or I guess lack thereof, in its own way. There's also multiple endings, depending on how you choose to deal with the Blight, an interesting enemy variety and a massive expanse of optional content completely outside of the main quest. It's an exciting, beautiful, and very sorrowful adventure, traveling through the dregs of a quiet and rotted kingdom, discovering the many stories of knights and warriors that tried to stave off the curse, and inevitably failed. Couples that were separated and even families that were lost as the weight of the curse pressed itself down on the kingdom. Lily, a white priestess, awakens in a derelict church with the spirit of an umbral knight at her side. His reasons for doing so are much deeper than what's on the surface, and he certainly won't be the only spirit by your side for long. Lily is able to take control of various spirits of animals, creatures, and even other knights and warriors and wizards defeat those that are afflicted by the Blight and purify them to recruit their spirits as allies, collecting different spirits, magical powers, ethereal weapons, and all sorts of interesting abilities. Some of the attacks are ranged while others are purely melee, some of them have a cooldown timer, 
Some of them can or can't be used underwater, so on and so forth. Once you've learned a fair bit of abilities, the game has an enhancement system where you can use the blight you've collected to upgrade whatever abilities you like. Even a couple of your movement abilities that are required to progress through the game can double as combat tools. Use the grapple hook to access high ground and set yourself up for a downward slam, or use the giant lance as, well, as a giant lance, I guess. The movement abilities are mostly the standard for what you would see in other Metroidvania platformers. You've got wall climbing, grappling, dashing, and sustained dashing, but you can also discover more uncommon abilities, such as a mask that allows you to breathe safely in the miasma of blight in the lower levels. Or at least kinda safely, I guess. Items known as relics are collectible throughout the kingdom, and while the enhancement system specifically upgrades spirits, relics are meant to give you more general bonuses and augments, such as more health restoratives, dealing more damage, an extra spirit gauge, movement and dash speed, you get the idea. And of course, you do have a means of expanding the amount of relics you can wear at once by collecting other items as well. Blight doubles as a sort of currency to upgrade spirits, and even triples as a means of gathering basic experience, and... I feel like this is a script I've typed before, and come to think of it, this is starting to feel like a video you've watched before too, right? Because if we get right down to it, all the things I've been describing gameplay-wise are pretty much basic elements of any Metroidvania, or for that matter, any 2D platformer you can find nowadays. An enhancement system is there because, well, who wouldn't want to feel the power of upgrading a weapon and venturing forth to that area you thought was too hard earlier? Relics are there because maximum HP boosts and damage modifiers have become such a common element in games like these that they're almost expected, even in games that aren't as actualized. You know the things I'm talking about, a set amount of health restoratives that you can eventually increase, upgradable powers, the occasional breakable wall that leads to another room you didn't know existed, a checkpoint system that refills all your resources and allows fast travel, the music suddenly cutting out when you enter a wide open room and you try to remember the last time you used a checkpoint because you know what's coming. Features like these are here because they kinda have to be. Things that were interesting and innovative just a decade or two ago are now bare-bones elements that games in this genre are sort of just expected to have as a bare minimum. But features like these are only what makes a game legible and easy to navigate. They're requirements, loosely speaking, but that's not all you should spend your time on if you're wanting to stand out as much as possible. These elements are the cogs in the machine, they're what make the game operable. Sort of in the same way that Lewiston, Idaho is operable. It has roads, it has signs and turnpikes, it has buildings, commerce, hospitals, schools, it has everything it needs to functionally qualify as a successful city. But that doesn't mean I want to go to Lewiston, Idaho. I want to preface that I'm only using Hollow Knight as a comparison here because it's an example most of my viewers will immediately understand. Hollow Knight had all of these features as well, items that augmented your playstyle with various bonuses like HP increases and damage buffs, filling your soul meter faster, and things of that nature. It had a lot of the same fundamental elements and components that would look very familiar in most other Metroidvanias. And of course, as you know, I never get tired of saying this next bit, I'm pretty positive this is the fifth time I'm bringing up this topic. Hollow Knight wasn't the game it was because it introduced any new ideas. It was the game it was because the atmosphere, music, navigation, gameplay, story, and just general creative direction were all in constant conversation with each other. It was great because a golden fucking eagle could squint at this game and still not point out with confidence where the seams were. I'm just now realizing I'm 
presenting this comparison in a way that sounds like it's at the expense of Ender Lilies, but it's actually only because Ender Lilies is one of the extremely, and I do mean extremely few Metroidvanias I've played in the past four years, that elicited similar feelings of curiosity and a lingering drive to keep moving forward and surrender myself into this beautifully dark world of dread and miasma. When you have multiple elements working together to build the same world, to where they're coexisting in the same room, it only makes the world itself feel that much more immersive. Walking around the outskirts of Land's End without the soundtrack feels awkward. I don't know, it doesn't even really give off a certain feeling, it just feels empty and incomplete. All it really does is make me realize what a bad decision I made turning the music off. The visuals by themselves seem wondrous and terrifying at the same time, almost to the extent of there being a visible conflict. It looks like Tim Burton during sometimes, and Lovecraft during others. It doesn't feel like anything has a concrete identity, at least not until the music is applied. When the gloomy, unobtrusive chord progressions are allowed to breathe, and all of the components of the world are free to coexist, everything I'm looking at starts to make sense. There's a very subtle whimsicality that now feels acknowledged, but it also adds a much deeper layer of humanity that perfectly captures just how hopeless and dejected this whisper of a kingdom has become, and any notes of hope or redemption are short-lived and suffocated by the returning dejection with the subtlety of a thunderstorm. It's a reminder that the Blighted didn't just come from the ground or from a distant land or wherever. They're people. They're people from this kingdom. People who felt their sanity dissolve into static at the last possible second before the Blight swallowed them whole. The further downward you venture into the Blight, the atmosphere becomes sharper and less subtle. The musical themes that play in the Verbatim Domain and the Stockade areas aren't anything like the softer, crestfallen melodies you heard up above. Once you pass a certain point, those melodies sort of just wither out and are replaced by these pulsating drones and these tense climactic builds. Everything just becomes increasingly chaotic and disjointed, and the soundscapes are perhaps even uncomfortable at times. It feels like an atmospheric representation for the Blight itself, and how the affliction slowly distorts the minds and bodies of its victims, which is perfectly represented by the soundscapes gradually descending into chaos where the kingdom just devolves into an infectious madhouse collapsing in on itself, until finally, you reach an area called the Abyss. <laughs> Waiting for you at the deepest reaches of Land's End is a pustulant blood-red core of veins and miasma. This is the furthest down you can go. The final area of the kingdom the epicenter of the Blighted Plague that houses two of the game's three endings. The brooding atmosphere is thicker here than anywhere else in the game. The subtle piano chords and tones we started the game with are gone. The chaos tapers off and is distorted into this low droning hum accompanied with disembodied gasps and moans so close to your ears that it genuinely startled me the first time I heard it. This area barely contains five rooms, if you can even call them that, and I still felt more overwhelmed here than anywhere else. It felt truly suffocating. 
The many androids in Nier Automata are seen as the final fragments of a dwindling human race, and humanity's last line of defense against an increasing horde of rogue machines. Additionally, it's one of the most depressing games I've ever played. What starts out as two friendly neighborhood androids going on missions together and working out the kinks and flaws in their own personal bond ends up unraveling into this grand tapestry of moral dilemmas, identity crises, and grief. It knows the commentary it's offering is more of a bite than anyone would willingly chew off, which is why Yokotaro doesn't reveal to you all of the story's meat and bones at once. Instead, it's one of the slowest burns imaginable. So slow that you play through the game twice, only to find out you're barely past the exposition. At the start of the adventure, you're faced with the odds already stacked up against you, and the chance of the androids preserving what little is left of humanity seems extremely slim. You learn more about the environments that surround you, what humans generations ago used as food or entertainment, but the world you're defending doesn't get any better. In fact, with every machine you dispatch, there are easily 10 more waiting for you to take its place. You aren't playing through a story about androids overcoming impossible odds with the power of friendship. You're playing through the records of the last semblances of hope humanity ever had to begin with. This isn't an adventure. It's an obituary. Fighting back against the Blighted, the Knights of Land's End experienced a very similar suffering. With every monstrosity that was cut down, the adversity ahead was ten times as deadly. You can find notes written by falling knights that served as part of the kingdom's front lines, notes that detail not only the nightmarish accounts of the monstrosities they faced, but the looming cloud of futility that grew thicker with each battle. Enderlilies may do a better job encapsulating the feeling of being infected than any other game I can think of. It's more than just wandering around in a dark kingdom and suddenly finding this pustulant material. You aren't just seeing or fighting the catalyst of the infection, you're experiencing it in multiple ways, both in and out of the game. It's wandering into the kingdom and hearing and feeling the consequences of the blight long before you even know it exists. Seeing Lily become more and more enveloped by this thick red plague, hearing the distorted late game musical themes that sound ready to break and spaz out of control at any second, and feeling constantly suffocated and boxed in by a lingering red mist, searching for some way to bypass it while becoming more aware that the only way out is through. And when it all works together, you are given this beautifully hopeless kingdom decorated with blood and sickness. It's as though the universe itself is alive, stretching out its frail, veiny finger and calling you over to its void. Of course, the game had its shortcomings. I mean, what game doesn't? Some of the animations didn't feel as fleshed out as I personally felt like they should have, and navigating to where I was supposed to go to next felt a little exhausting at times. But it was never anything you spent more than a second or two thinking about. Because the game does everything else so well and so seamlessly that any of the game's minor shortcomings almost give the game its own weird sort of personality. I'm not expecting this game to surge to the popularity of the ones I usually cover on this channel, but I do see lots of games like this one achieving this huge spotlight for about a week, more or less, but after that time, the game just kinda fizzles out of relevance. And I don't feel like Ender Lilies really deserves that. 
This is one of those games that deserves to find the community that's looking for it, even if it is just a small number of people in a Discord server sharing a mutual obsession over it and other games like it. Even if it is just the small amount of people that will probably watch this video because it isn't what I usually talk about, I still feel like that would be enough. This game doesn't deserve to live behind the shadows of something that hasn't even come out yet. I can't really deny that I kind of fell in love with the game, even if for a week or so, and I want to make sure others that are looking for this type of game have that same opportunity. I'm fully prepared for this game to not rise to the same acclaim or receive the same following of other Metroidvanias before it, but I will be damned if I sit here and let it fly completely under the radar. Thank you.